write out a mechanism and draw an energy profile for sulfonation of benzene. So the overall reaction of sulfonation of benzene is the conversion of benzene to benzene sulfonic acid. So as shown here, and uh, you know you need some heat and you would need to add sulfuric acid. So in sulfuric acid, you know this is a protonated form of sulfuric acid, and you know just a proton has been moved from here to there. And uh, you can imagine that this oxygen, once it gets protonated, this lo the loss of water can occur, and it produces this uh, SO3 species, which now is well set up to do a reaction with the benzene ring. So once benzene ring electrophilic aromatic substitution can occur, and uh, this uh, is an equilibrium process, uh, and it can be. Uh, it can give you this kind of an intermediate which is a cationic intermediate and in the next step uh, there is a loss of H plus that can occur which is mediated by this uh, hydrogen sulfate ion uh, you know which is basically the conjugate base of uh, sulfuric acid and it's going to give you this benzene sulfonate ion and sulfuric acid okay. And uh, now once this is formed, the benzene, the aromaticity is restored. So we would expect that uh, this process is quite uh, fast. Okay. So uh, one thing, one aspect about this reaction that is different from uh, regular uh, electrophilic aromatic substitution is that this reaction requires a reasonable amount of heat. And uh, second thing is that it produces a, an anion, which is benzene sulfonate ion. In order to look at the energy profile, uh, the first step of the reaction uh, is uh, very similar to that of what we would see with an electrophilic aromatic substitution. So you have the benzene ring sort of interacting with the electrophile and uh, producing this delta plus species in the transition state, which then gives you this intermediate that we are very familiar with. And the next step is the reaction of the conjugate base here, which is sulfate to give you uh, so it will be S double bond O, O, O minus. So this is the species that is going to be uh, attacking the benzene ring and picking up a proton, giving you the product. One thing to consider here is that given that the first step is a slow step, so the barrier to that uh, first step might be quite high. And also being in equilibrium, the reverse step is also accessible at room temperature or at the temperature at which we are doing this reaction. So together, the sulfonation of benzene is a reaction that happens which is very similar to any other electrophilic aromatic substitution reaction. Write a reasonable mechanism for the formation of cyclohexyl benzene from the reaction of benzene, cyclohexene and sulfuric acid. Okay, So the question here is that uh, we start with benzene. plus cyclohexene and H2SO4. So the question is what is the product that is formed under these conditions. Okay. So when we have to uh, look at these kinds of reactions, let's just go back to the basics and you know what we could expect is that cyclohexene being the more reactive of the between benzene and cyclohexene, cyclohexene is more reactive towards electrophiles. And so we would expect that this picks up a proton from uh, sulfuric acid and it produces a cyclohexyl cation. And now we know from our uh, many examples that we have already looked at, uh, we know that a cyclohexyl cation is now going to be the system which can react with benzene and uh, an electrophilic aromatic substitution can, can occur. And the product that is going to be formed is cyclohexyl benzene. Okay. When you encounter questions such as these, uh, the right thing to do is to understand the difference in reactivity. So an olefin is more reactive than benzene. For example, we have looked at previously that bromination of olefins is possible, epoxidation of olefins is possible, but benzene itself doesn't react unless you add a Lewis acid. And clearly there is no epoxidation equivalent for benzene under normal conditions. So the reaction shown below gives a single product in 88% yield. Uh, the question is what is the product? Okay. So if I have to understand this uh, reaction, 
uh, what I need to do is I need to look at the compounds that are reacting. Okay, so here is an acid chloride, and acid chloride, as you know, in the presence of a Lewis acid, can produce the corresponding oxocarbonium ion, and so this is going to be the uh, the kind of intermediate that can be produced. And now, when I look at uh, one three five trimethoxybenzene, this you know if just by looking at the symmetry of this molecule, all these three positions which are present here, uh, 1, 2 and 3, they are equivalent. So it's almost like a benzene ring in the sense that uh, it's highly symmetric. And so in the presence of aluminum chloride, it, one of these positions is going to react and electrophilic aromatic substitution would occur here and the product that would be formed is the corresponding ketone. So this is the product that you expect from this reaction. What is uh, primary kinetic isotope effect and how does this help in understanding the electrophilic aromatic substitution reaction mechanism? Okay, So let's now try and understand what a primary kinetic uh, isotope effect is and using an equation. So the kinetic isotope effect is defined as the rate constant for a reaction that happens with hydrogen and divided that by the rate constant of the reaction that happens when the hydrogen is replaced by deuterium. Okay, So uh, this is a very powerful technique that can be used to understand uh, reaction mechanisms. So the example that we will take here is the elimination reaction. So as you know, the elimination reaction occurs when you have a bromide uh, and here the example here that is, uh, that is shown here is the following. Uh, so when you have this bromide on the left, what happens is that you know you expect the elimination to occur. So one of these hydrogens is going to be picked up, and it's going to give you this olefin as the product. Okay, and the base that we use is uh, sodium ethoxide. So what we do is we measure the rate of the reaction and determine the rate constant for this particular reaction. So I can follow the the loss of this bromide and the formation of this olefin. And uh, when these are two hydrogens, uh, I can follow the reaction and determine the rate constant. Very similarly, what I do is I replace both these hydrogens by deuterium. Okay, so then what I do is I can then measure the same uh, under similar conditions. I measure the rate of the reaction, and then I determine the rate constant. And the product is as shown here, where the hydrogen is replaced by deuterium. Okay, so now if these two measurements can be done. So OET minus is expected to come attack here and kick out the bromide. Okay. Now if these reactions can be monitored and if the carbon hydrogen bond is involved in the rate determining step. Okay. So if the carbon hydrogen bond breaking of the carbon hydrogen bond is involved in the rate determining step, then what we expect is that the hydrogen bearing compound reacts substantially faster than the deuterium bearing compound. Okay, You will probably read about this in one of your later courses, the origin of this effect. But this helps us understand whether the carbon hydrogen bond is involved in the rate determining step. So in this case, we have very good evidence that this hydrogen is involved in the reaction. And therefore, we would expect that the carbon hydrogen bond would break faster than the carbon deuterium bond, and uh, because it's involved in the rate determining step, and the kinetic isotope effect for this uh, reaction is about seven. Okay, so therefore, from this we can conclude that uh, the carbon hydrogen bond is involved in the rate determining step. Now, when we come to uh, electrophilic aromatic substitution. As you know, the mechanism of the reaction, the first step of the reaction is the reaction with the electrophile and producing this cation, which then subsequently loses a proton to form the product. So in the first step, there is no carbon hydrogen bond that is being formed or broken. And therefore, one cannot expect a primary hydrogen isotope effect. But in the second step, which we have designated as the fast step, there is a carbon hydrogen bond that is being broken. Now, when we do the reaction, we do the experiment where 
we replace all hydrogens by deuterium and measure the rate of the reaction. Uh, what we find is that KH by KD equals 1. Okay, So what this tells us is that the breakage of the carbon-hydrogen bond, although it occurs during the reaction, it is not involved in the rate determining step. So because the rate determining step is the loss of aromaticity which is the first step. So the primary hydrogen isotope effect can be used to understand electrophilic aromatic substitution reaction because it supports the mechanism that we have proposed where the rate determining step is the first step. And the primary hydrogen isotope effect being 1 tells us that the carbon hydrogen bond is not being broken in the rate determining step but it is being broken after the rate determining step is happening. How many signals would you expect to find in the proton NMR spectrum of each of the following compounds? So there are four compounds that are given, one bromobutane, one butanol, butane and one four dibromobutane. So from our uh, previous discussions on NMR, we know that uh, protons are equivalent to one another and have the same chemical shift when they are in equivalent environments. So the key word here is the environment. So whatever a particular proton is the kind of environment that it is around and that is around it has to be similar. Okay. Uh, usually in many cases it's very easy to decide. So for example if I take the example of benzene, you know all these hydrogens that are shown here they have the same chemical shift and they are equivalent because they are in the same equivalent environment. Okay. So methane for example is another example where you can clearly say that all of them are equivalent. The last example is uh, tetramethylsilane which we have seen many times CH3, CH3, CH3 and CH3. All the 12 hydrogens are equivalent because they are in exactly the same environment. Okay, But in some cases it may not be as straightforward to understand this and so what we can do is to, to mentally replace a proton in a molecule by a test group. Okay, So what I mean by that is that in order to see if two hydrogens that you are interested in have the same chemical shift, what we need to do is we need to replace one of them by another atom. Okay, So for example, let's take propane. So propane's uh, structure is shown here and if I want to understand whether this methyl group and this methyl group are the same, one way to do this is I take this carbon 1 and one of the hydrogens I replace it with chlorine. Okay, So then the resulting molecule that I get is 1-chloropropane. Now I do the same exercise on the other methyl group which is at carbon 3 where I replace one of the hydrogens by chlorine. And I get exactly the same molecule which is basically 1-chloropropane. So therefore, if the two structures provided by produced by a mental replacement of two different hydrogens in a molecule give you the same molecule, then the hydrogens are chemically equivalent. So from this exercise, what we can figure out is that the methyl groups of propane are identical. Okay. So in case of uh, propane, these six hydrogens are the same. And therefore, this, this will contribute to one signal. And this, uh, I'm sorry, this is a CH2 here. And this methylene group would be the second signal. And so therefore, the total number of signals that you would see here is 2. Okay. So this is a very, very standard way to identify how many distinct signals are there in a, or are expected in a molecule. So now let's go to the question. The question that we have is 1-bromobutane. Uh, so now in this 1-bromobutane, uh, there are three methylene groups. So CH2, CH2 and CH2 and then there's one methyl group. Okay. So the methyl group is clearly one signal and there is no sort of dispute about it. Now what we need to understand is whether these two CH2s or these three CH2s are similar. Now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to highlight this uh, hydrogen over here and 
Now, if, if I replace this hydrogen by chlorine, then what I'm going to get is 2 chloro, 4 bromo butane. Okay. Now, when I replace this hydrogen by a chlorine group, then I get 1, 2, or if I have to number it from the other side, then it becomes 1 bromo, 2 chloro butane. Okay. So, clearly, these two are very different compounds. Needless to say, if I replace one of these two hydrogens by a chlorine, I am going to get an entirely different compound. So therefore, what we can conclude from this uh, discussion is that these three CH2s are different. So therefore, you would get 1 plus 3, then you will get 4 distinct signals in NMR spectrum. Now, 1-butanol is exactly the same until here. You get the same uh, pattern. That is, you are going to get four signals as we discussed in one bromobutane. The only additional hydrogen here is the OH and so you would expect five distinct signals in one butanol. Okay. Now the next uh, compound that we are going to look at is butane. So in the case of butane, what we have is that we have these two methyl groups. Let's start with this. Now if I replace this uh, methyl group by a chloro, I get 1 chloro butane and if I replace this with chloro then I also get 1 chloro butane. So therefore these two methyl groups are indeed identical. Now coming to the next uh, set of uh, CH2s, uh, if I have to find out whether they are equivalent or not, let me replace one of these hydrogens by a chloro. So then I would get 2 chloro butane. Now if I do the same thing for this hydrogen, I end up getting 2 chlorobutane. So therefore these two CH2s are also identical. So the number of signals that you would expect to see here is 1 for the methyl and 1 for the methylene. So it will be 2. Now the last question here is 1,4-dibromobutane. So again here there are 4 CH2s and you know we essentially need not compare the green CH2s and the blue CH2s. But let's take the, the two terminal CH2s first. So if we replace this hydrogen, one of these hydrogens, by chloro, then you get 1 chloro, 1 bromo butane. I mean uh, 1 chloro, 1 bromo, 4 bromo butane. Similarly, if I replace one of these hydrogens, I get 1 chloro, 1 bromo, 4 bromo butane. So these two compounds are identical, so therefore the green CH2s are the same. Now if you do a similar exercise with this, you will find that these two CH2s are also identical. So therefore, you get 1 plus 1 that's equal to 2 signals. Okay, so now this problem basically shows us that, you know, when benzene is reacted with this aliphatic chloride, you end up with a mixture of two products. Okay, and so first we will try and tackle why there are two products formed, and then we'll try to understand the sort of ratio that is formed and why there is a major product and so on. So as a general rule, so let's say we start with any chloride. So let's say you take R. Cl plus Al Cl3. Okay, so we already discussed this in the class and other things. So you generate basically a carbocation plus Al Cl4 minus. Okay, so now when R plus is actually very stable, then you know it's fine, but if it is not very stable. And if the reaction conditions allow us, then you could actually imagine that there could be a rearrangement of the carbocation, which you have already studied previously. Okay, so let's take this example over here. Let me just number these carbons so that it's easy for us to keep track. So this is number one, two, three, four, and five. Okay, so if we keep the same numbering, one, two, three, four, and five, okay? 
So here if we keep this as 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So now that we establish this numbering, it becomes quite straightforward for us to address this question. So RCL here is basically 2, 3, 4. So we start with CL. So 1, 2, 3, 4 and cover number 5. Okay. So now once you go through the coordination with aluminum chloride and the formation of the carbocation, you would end up with carbocation which is a primary carbocation. Okay, so let's just keep the same numbering. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay, and we all know that a primary carbocation is fairly unstable and it can rearrange. But nevertheless, if it reacts from this as this carbocation, okay, so then you can imagine that it attacks here and then it gives you a benzene ring with a positive charge and there's a hydrogen over here. So then if you just number the carbons, it's one, two, three, four, and there's actually one more carbon, so we just add this carbon number five. Okay. So that's our number five over here and the rest of the aromatic ring uh, basically remains the same and then if this gives up a proton then we'll end up with this product okay now if there was a situation where this carbon number two is going to have a high right so let me just number it over here so this carbon number two is going to have a hydride as shown here you could have a hydride migration okay and that would give me a more stable secondary carbocation right so if i just keep the same numbering so i'm five four three two one so the positive charge the hydride has moved from carbon 2 to carbon 1. So that hydride I'm going to draw with the same color, which is here. And there's going to be a positive charge over here. Okay. And now if this carbocation reacts, then you're going to end up with this product as shown here. Okay. Now this gives us the framework for explaining the formation of the two products. Okay. But now how can we account for the compound number two? I mean, the substituted compound on the right being higher in yield. Okay, so what actually happens is that the benzene ring reacts with the primary carbocation perhaps as soon as it's formed, and some of the carbocation is still available for it to undergo a rearrangement to give you the secondary carbocation, and then the secondary carbocation being more stable. Is going to be, you know, the reaction is going to move towards the right. In this case, the carbocation is going to rearrange and give you a secondary carbocation, and that's going to react and give you the major product. So you can explain both the formation of the product and the ratio using the formation of the carbocation and the stability of the carbocation. All right. So here the question is, how would you? Synthesize this compound using a Friedel Crafts acylation reaction. So, because we saw in the previous problem that if you have a Friedel Crafts alkylation that is going on, then you invariably end up with a mixture of products. So, if you attempt a Friedel Crafts alkylation reaction, then you're going to get a mixture of this compound as well as the rearranged product. So this is going to be a problem and in fact this might even be the major product. Okay. So in order to avoid this, we want to use a friedel crafts acylation. Now let's look at the steps that are going to be involved. So friedel crafts acylation basically would mean that you break this carbon-carbon bond 
And so you have two fragments here. You have the benzene ring and you would need a carbocation or a oxocarbinium ion such as this. Okay. So this is going to be the most important step. And so if you attack, imagine that there's going to be an attack here and then this movement of this bond to the C-double bond O, then you would end up with product such as this. Okay, so C-double bond O. And then you have the ethyl group outside. So this is basically ethyl phenyl ketone and this can subsequently be reduced. So we'll come to the reduction part. But now the question is, in Friedel Crafts A solution, you don't see a rearrangement. Now let's look at why or how do we explain that we don't see any rearrangement. Let's now look at the structure of the acylium cation. So you have a C triple bond O plus and unlike a carbocation where there's a beta hydride which can move and give you a more stable carbocation when you go from primary to secondary or secondary to tertiary. Here, the movement of hydride ion can certainly occur, but that will result in a cation that is less stable. Okay, so if we sort of push the arrows, then you end up getting. So if you number this as one, two, three, and four, then this is one, two, three, and four, and so your hydrogen ends up here, and it's a cation over here. Okay. So if I redraw this, what I get is C double bond O, H with a positive charge over here. Okay. So we know that the carbonyl group is an electron withdrawing group. So you can certainly say that this is going to be highly unlikely. Okay. So therefore, a rearrangement of the acylium cation once it is formed is extremely unlikely which is why it's the acylation reaction is more predictable. Okay, Now, let's go to the next step, which is it's not difficult for us to now synthesize this molecule, which is this ketone. right? And now, from the ketone, we need to get to the final product, which is C, right? We need to get here. So there are uh, two strategies that have been suggested and the first one is basically the Wolf-Kishner reduction which is basically a reaction with uh, hydrazine which is NH2, NH2 in the presence of hydroxide ion, usually potassium hydroxide or sodium hydroxide and then we heat. Okay. So this is the first condition which is used, which is known as wolf Kishner production. Okay. So this is one way to do it. I would urge all of you to go and look at the mechanism of this reaction. The other way to do it is to use the Clemenson reduction, which is C L E. M M E N S E N Clemenson reduction, which is basically a zinc amalgam in HCl. Okay, so you can use either of these methods, and this is going to give you the the product that is desired. Okay, so I want you to go back and revise this concept that you learned previously. And look at the mechanism of this Wolf Krishna reduction. So, now let's look at this problem, which is basically the reaction of cyclohexene in the presence of an acid with benzene. Okay, so let's draw out the structures of these two molecules and then reason out what could be the product that is formed. So, cyclohexene is basically this, and then reaction with benzene in the presence of H plus. Okay, so you know, benzene is going to be quite stable in the presence of H plus. 
cyclohexene one might imagine that it can actually get protonated so if it gets protonated then you end up with a compound such as this where you have a cyclohexyl carbocation okay and now you can propose that there's an attack by the benzene ring on the carbocation and you may end up with a compound which is along the lines of this okay so you now you go through the steps of the friedel crafts alkylation reaction and you end up with this compound okay so the product here is actually interesting because you know that the cyclohexane primarily exists in the chair conformation so if we were to draw this compound out in the chair conformation so it would look something like this okay and here you have two choices that is the benzene ring could occupy the equatorial position or you can have the ring flipped isomer which is here and here the benzene could occupy the axial position so just to remind you this is the equatorial position and here it is the axial position okay so just for clarity's sake let me just draw out this hydrogen so that it becomes obvious okay so now the question is i i believe that the stereochemistry is fine but now the question is what would be the major product okay so given that there is no no other driving factor over here one would argue that the equatorial substituent uh, the bulky substituent which is the phenyl ring uh, would prefer to occupy the equatorial position and therefore we would suggest that this compound is the major product 